Welcome, everyone. This is April 24th, and we're still on lockdown here in Bogota over the coronavirus. We're in a series of messages on the book of Isaiah. And we're at Isaiah chapter 9. To give you the background, the book of Isaiah is about the day of the Lord. Isaiah said, the last of the times. And so if we um, look at what a prophetic day is or time, in Scripture, Peter said that with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And Moses said something similar in Psalm 90. And um, so if we count from the beginning of creation, from when Adam was created, to now, adding everything up according to the scriptures, we're at a little more than 6,000 years of human history. 6,000 years uh, that have been marked by all kinds of... Um, different things that man has done, starting with uh, rebelling against God. And um, we don't really know when exactly Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. There must have been some time lapse between when Adam was created and then when Eve was created and brought out of Adam, and then um, when um, they were kicked out of the garden. We don't know if God created them as babies and raised them or if he created them as adults, as many seem to think. But um, obviously there was some time in the garden. We don't know how much. We know that God created everything good, and he said that uh, even very good when he described man in the beginning. And uh, man was clean, innocent, and... Um, Everything went well as long as he was in fellowship with God. And then came the problem. God's world is based on truth. In the scriptures, when we talk about world, we're talking about a system, a way of doing things. When we talk about earth, we're talking about um, the people of God, the promised land, and in a broader sense, the planet. The world that we have now is not God's world. It's not based on truth. It's based on lies. In fact, even though Satan was part of a creation that was labeled as being good by God, he chose to rebel. And the first instance of that is when he deceived Eve with lies. And from then on, we have had a whole world system developed by Satan based on lies. And the, the consequences of this are sin and death. In fact, there is a law of sin and death because the soul that sins, according to Scripture, shall die. And so God has spent 6,000 years developing his plan of redemption with some very key moments in history, such as the advent of Jesus Christ about 2,000 years ago, and Jesus' ministry, and his death for us on the cross and his resurrection. That was a huge game changer because it denied Satan his empire of death. Death had been trapping virtually everyone, and Jesus was able to break the power of death and release those that are his. And he ascended on high. The scripture says in Ephesians 4, high above all heavens. In other words, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. And Jesus is the Word of God. And according to some of the Psalms of David, uh, they, they ratify us of God having put his word above the heavens. 
even above his truth and above his mercy. David referred to this as his spoken word. And we have the possibility of coming into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit and being able to communicate directly with him. In other words, the Holy Spirit can communicate to our spirit. And our conscience can be activated. And we can know when we're doing something that God doesn't like. We come under conviction of the Holy Spirit. And we can know when what we're doing is pleasing to God. Because we can tell by the Holy Spirit. And um, Jesus wants to develop this even further. He told his disciples before he died that he wants us to be able to communicate directly with his Father. And the only way we can do that is if we're clean. So in the uh, tabernacle of Moses, in the temple of Solomon, this was portrayed uh, here on earth by having three basic places, an outer court where people could come with their sacrifices, an inner court where you had to be born into the family of Aaron of the tribe of Levi in order to go into the holy place where the lampstand was with the seven lamps of fire and the table with the showbread and then a veil separated the holy of holies which had the ark of the covenant and the golden altar of incense that had four horns symbolizing heavenly power and so God wants to have a people, a clean people, that can pray to him, symbolized by that golden altar of incense, and uh, be in direct contact with him, and where he can respond. And um, David records in Psalm 18, and later amplifies this in 1 Samuel chapter 22, about what happened when he was in trouble, and God decided to intervene. And uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous description of God lowering the heavens and coming down. Thunder and lightning and shaking of heaven and earth. And um, riding upon a, the wings of the wind and upon a cherubim that are extremely powerful angels that are associated with the throne of God. And this is all... Um, precursor and uh, living parable in terms of what's about to happen now in the day of the Lord, because Jesus is about to return in power. At his first coming, the scripture says that it shook the earth. You remember when he was crucified, there was a tremendous earthquake and the rocks were split and the veil in the temple between the holy place and the holy of holies was split open. And of course, the corrupt priest at the temple, lost no time in repairing the veil. But uh, Jesus went in to the heavenly realm as our new high priest to intercede for us and to bring about the new covenant where instead of having the law on tablets of stone that the children of Israel couldn't keep in their own strength, uh, they, um, the new covenant is when God writes his laws in our hearts and in our souls and in our minds and and changes us from the inside out. And so we're going back. I mean, we're, we're going forward into time, but God's plan isn't to take us back to how Adam was before the fall. Adam before the fall, um, even though there was... He was clean and innocent before he sinned, but the presence of God was still external. Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening, just like Jesus walked with his disciples. There was something special there with Jesus, and Jesus was able to commission them and send them out in his name with power and with authority. But when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, when Jesus ascended and sent the Holy Spirit... It was a game changer because now the presence of God could be within us. Paul described this as a, as a great mystery 
in the times before the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so now when Lord Jesus Christ is about to return in his second coming with power and authority, he's going to bring with him all those that are his. The, the ones that he freed from death and, and took to be with him. They're described in, in Revelation chapter 6 as being under the heavenly altar, not being held by death as described by Hades in Greek or Sheol in Hebrew. He has expanded the body of Christ. And now Christ is a body of many members with Jesus as the head. And uh, this is all going to be put on display. In fact, uh, in the letter to the Thessalonians, Paul describes how we can be a part of that, and we will be a part of that if we are among those that are alive and remain when Jesus returns. And we can't come into the fullness of what God has for us until the ones that have gone before are resurrected and all of us together. Um, come into the kingdom of God as it will be manifested openly here on the earth. And so Jesus is coming back for a bride, that's his people, corporate people, same as his body, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, according to Scripture. God wants a display of a clean people of God. And up until now, we've had clean individuals and maybe even little groups scattered here or there. But essentially, the people of God, whether you describe them as Israel or the church, which are supposed to be one new man in Christ, the enemy got in when men slept, according to Scripture, and planted tares, sons of the evil one, camouflaged in among the people of God. And this has worked to give God's people a bad reputation. And in addition to this, we have another problem in that we have people that are sitting on the fence. They're claiming to be Christians. Some are Christian in name only. They haven't made a total commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, but they haven't gone out and openly joined the devil either. They're what Scripture calls lukewarm. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus says that... Um, he would rather have us hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Revelation, like Isaiah, is also about the day of the Lord. And so in the day of the Lord, as things develop, we have a huge change. Instead of Satan opposing God's people and throwing everything that he can at it at them, everything from frontal opposition to kill and destroy, to infiltration, to undermine from within. He's tried all of this with varying degrees of his success over the centuries. The word tribulation is used in Scripture 55 times, and 54 of them are used before we get to the book of Revelation in what many theologians call the Great Tribulation. In fact, those that are standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb and the scripture says that they've come out of great tribulation. This happens in Revelation even before the events of pouring out the vials of God's wrath that are being called the great tribulation. So every true believer, all the way back and starting with Abel, who was the first martyr killed by his brother Cain, all the way through history, 6,000 years of it, and maybe a bit more, there have been martyrs that actually got killed because of their faith, and there have been what we call living martyrs, like the Apostle John, who he's called a martyr in Revelation chapter 1. Martyr is the same word in Greek as witness. And according to what we know of history, the Apostle John seems to be the only one 
of the original apostles that did not die a natural death, excluding Judas, who, belayed, who betrayed the Lord. And yet he's in God's book as a martyr. Why, why would he be called a martyr when nobody actually killed him for his faith? Well, if you look closely in the gospel, the person that was standing at the foot of the cross as Jesus was dying, and when Jesus looked down and there was Mary and a few women, and there was the apostle John. In Matthew's account, he didn't see that. All he saw was a few women following from afar as they took Jesus off to crucify him. And I think the reason for that is that Matthew was even further away than the women. Because all of the disciples fled, but John was the one that recovered and was there in the trial and never left the side of the Lord. Went all the way to the cross received the responsibility of caring for Mary and for his other brothers and sisters, the whole family, as the eldest son. And uh, at any time, somebody could have said, there he is, he's one of them too. String him up too. And so John repeatedly put his life on the line for the Lord. He was Jesus' probably best human friend during the time of his ministry. John understood things, and they're there in the Gospel of John, about the future and about the coming kingdom of God. If, if Peter was the apostle that was given the responsibility for the, giving the gospel to the Jews, and Paul was the one given the responsibility to be the lead apostle to the Gentiles, John is the apostle who... Um, Tremendous revelation about the future, tied in with the coming kingdom of God, which many call the millennium. And when Jesus was rehabilitating Peter on the beach after the resurrection, and just like Peter had denied the Lord three times, Jesus gave him the opportunity to reaffirm his love for the Lord three times. And John was walking along behind and, and got to witness this. And so Peter said to the Lord, after the Lord told Peter how he was going to die, Peter wanted to know about John. How, how's John going to die? The Lord told Peter, Peter was going to be a martyr, an actual martyr. And, um, well, what about John? And basically the Lord said to him, it's really none of your business. What is it to you if he lives until I return? Okay. And so now over history, we think that, well, uh, in fact, um, John had to um, quell the rumors because he said, I mean, Jesus didn't say that in a definite way. He said, what is it to you? Okay. But when you think about the first resurrection, and that being from our present um vantage point or, or point in time regarding prophecy, the first resurrection isn't really that far away. See? And the first resurrection, according to Thessalonians, seems to happen slightly before Jesus actually returns. In other words, the dead in Christ are raised, and then we're caught up to meet him in the air as he comes back. So, John actually could be alive when Jesus returns, if you look at it that way. Along with Abraham and David, all the heroes described in the Scriptures and many more. This is described as raising an army. Raising an army in the Scriptures. And the Scripture says that God's going to have an army in this last day the like of which has never been before and never will be again, according to Joel chapter 2 and portions of Isaiah and portions of Revelation. God's going to have an army that has never been, 
like this before and never will be in the future. Why? Because when Jesus estab establishes his kingdom of righteousness here on the earth, he's going to do away with war. So where are we headed right now? We're headed into a war to end all wars. And Jesus is described as leading the armies of heaven on a white horse, and his name written on his thigh is the Word of God. And that's his sword. And he fights in righteousness. There is no collateral damage. In God's army, up until now, we've had the armor described in Ephesians chapter 6. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the breastplate, which is actually a the word really means a, a suit of chain mail of the righteousness of Christ that protects all the way from the neck down to the ankles. But in this end time, we're about to see a different aspect to this. You remember the children of Israel when they went through the wilderness? For the first 38 years, the battles were all defensive. And the ones that didn't have their heart in it, the ones that didn't believe God, the ones that were disobedient died along the way, even though the Lord continued to provide for them miraculously. Pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, water from the rock, manna every day, clothes that didn't wear out, shoes that didn't wear out. But um, the lukewarm got separated out. The tares got separated out because when they left, it says they were a mixed multitude. And by the time they got it 38 years into this, the battle started turning to where they were actually sent out to confront the enemy. And they had an amazing battle with a thousand men from each tribe. And uh, one of the leaders was Eliezer, the grandson of Aaron, with the trumpet. Back then, the trumpet was used to control the communications. They didn't have radios or other means of communication. The trumpet could sound the advance or the retreat. They were all different calls of the trumpet. And the trumpet was near the standard bearer. And the standard bearer and the trumpet had to be next to the commander of the army. And the commander of the army transitioned from Moses to Joshua, which means Jesus. And Joshua led them into the promised land. Well, now we're making a similar transition. We're about to go into a, another uh, dimension. Some people think it's a literal thousand years that those that are selected for the first resurrection will reign with Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verse Six verses deal with this. A time in which the devil will be completely subdued and locked up for a thousand years. But you see, Revelation has, is full of symbolic passages, signs, and um, the numbers all have prophetic significance. And it's hard to tell what's literal and what's uh, a symbol. And actually, both can happen. And so we don't know if we're going to see a literal thousand years millennial reign or if we're talking the day of the Lord, which a day could be a thousand years or a thousand years could be a day. We've had a literal 6,000 years of hum human history up until now. We just don't know at what point Satan's world started because we don't know exactly when Adam and Eve were expelled. So the, we, we can't know for sure what could have happened behind the scenes. We know that behind the scenes, in the story of Job, uh, some negotiations took place between God and Satan. There was actually a wager placed between God and Satan that if Satan were allowed to take 
away everything that Job had and then also take away his health, that Job would deny the Lord and blaspheme the Lord. And they actually ran, ran with it. And uh, so Job didn't know what happened. Job's comforters that went over there to try and straighten this mess out, they were sure Job must have done something wrong. God didn't tell anyone here on earth, but he revealed it all in the end. In fact, Satan said, he, he'll blaspheme you to your face. Well, what did that mean? That meant that sooner or later in this whole thing, Job would come face to face with God. It's an amazing story. And God restored Job, opened his eyes so that he could see in the spiritual realm, and then had Job intercede for his three friends that didn't understand what was going on. Very similar to the case with Joseph, who got sold by his brothers as a slave to Egypt, and God used it to prepare the way for the whole family and to restore the brothers into fellowship and to actually build the nation of Israel under the protective government of Joseph in Egypt. That's another message. But these are all types of living parables of what we're facing now in the time of the end. And so Isaiah is talking about the day of the Lord and how it would be darkness and gloom and how when God's people act the same and bear the same fruit as the ungodly, as those that are not God's people, as the pagans that surrounded them, the time would come when God would decide that there had to be a day of reckoning and would lift his protection and let the enemies come in. Um, a very interesting place is in Isaiah 7. In Isaiah 7, the um, ten tribes of Israel to the north the tribes that were eventually lost and totally lost their, their identification as the people of God, they, they went so overboard into licentiousness and God kept sending them prophets, tremendous prophets such as Elijah and Elisha. And they were in Israel and Isaiah was a prophet in Judah, the southern kingdom. And... Um, Isaiah prophesied during the time of four kings, starting with Uzziah, then going to Ahaz, then Jotham, and then um, Hezekiah. And the, um, I got it wrong. I, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So Isaiah was sent by God to Ahaz at the time of a confederacy, a conspiracy between Israel and Syria. The king of Israel and the king of Syria made an alliance, an unholy alliance, and they went and attacked Jerusalem, and they weren't able to take it. But when the inhabitants of Jerusalem found out that it wasn't just the Syrians attacking him. Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, were out there attacking him too. Well, they lost heart. It's just like, like a tree in the wind. And so God sent Isaiah to say, look, I've got this covered. Trust me. You can rest. I'll take care of this. And, they, and uh, King Ahaz didn't believe the prophet, didn't believe God, wouldn't, wouldn't accept the fact that God was going to deliver them. He panicked and totally lost it. And so God sent Isaiah there and, and gave a nickname to Isaiah's son. He said, when you introduce your son to the king, his name is... Um, His name is, let me see if I can find it here, Shear Jasabub. 
C.R. Jazup. What a name. It means a remnant shall return. In other words, King Ahaz, if you don't believe God, um, if you don't believe what God is saying about Israel, Israel, in 65 years, they're going to be history. They're going to disappear as a people. And uh, down here in Judah, if you guys don't listen, you're going to be taken captive. You're going to be held captive in Babylon for 70 years, according to the prophet Jeremiah. But uh, I want you to meet my son here. His name is A Remnant Shall Return. Because God will fulfill his plans and his purposes, even if we fail. The children of Israel, when they could have gone into the promised land and didn't, well, God didn't go back on his word. He took them around the wilderness, around and around and around, until the unbelievers died off, and then had a people prepared that believed him and followed the ark into the promised land. So what's going to happen now? Where were we at in history? Is this thing with the coronavirus one of the woes prophesied in Revelation, or is this just a drill? A lot of things hinge on our response. When, when people refuse to repent, that can trigger judgment. When God's people refuse to believe and to enter in, that can delay things. But I kind of have the feeling that things have been delayed long enough, and the world has been going down the drain past the point of no return. And uh, my prayer has been for many years that God would intervene absolutely as soon as possible. We don't like what's going on in our schools. We don't like what's going on in many universities. Um, a lot of churches are way off the rails. Uh, people focused on themselves, like the church of the Laodiceans. Uh, Jesus is outside knocking to see if they'll let him back in. And, um, who would have ever thought something could happen that would shut everything down cold in such a short period of time? Who would have thought, here in Colombia, I don't know how it is in other countries, but here in Colombia, we're in a lockdown, and you can't have a meeting of more than 10 people. The churches are closed. I never thought I'd see an Easter Sunday with so many empty cathedrals and empty places of worship. But not only are the churches closed, the bars are closed, the discotheques are closed, the houses of prostitution are closed. Everything you can think of, even restaurants, closed. I think God's message to us as believers today is the same message as he sent by Isaiah to King Ahaz. Ahaz means sustained possessor. And we've got a problem with people trying to create their own kingdoms in the name of God. And uh, he came from a godly grandfather, a godly father, and Ahaz lost it. And then his son was a godly king, King Hezekiah. But we have had a lot of trouble among the people of God with people trying to possess what ought to be the kingdom of God, and control other people instead of putting them into a relationship and under the control of the Holy Spirit. And so God wants his people to be in a direct relationship with him. And I believe anyone whose heart's right. Now, this is the message. Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear, neither be faint-hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of resin with Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it. Let us divide it between us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. If we can believe God now, all of the horrible things that the devil would bombard us with all of the conspiracy theories. If we go here to um, 
Isaiah 8. It says, Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. God is with us? Well, that was the sign. King Ahaz didn't want a sign. He didn't want to tempt God. But the sign is, a virgin shall conceive. And bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That means God with us. Now, the God that they wanted to have with us was the son of Tabiel. Tabiel means God is good. We see throughout religion, throughout Christendom, Impressive places of worship. A lot of singing about how good God is. And it's true that God is good. But I come out of some of these places thinking, you know something? I think they're trying to recreate God in the image of man. They want, they want a God like us. And God wants us to be like Him. And in order for us to be like Him... Something in us has to change radically. Our hearts have to be circumcised by the Word of God, by the sword of the Spirit. And uh, unless we humble ourselves before God and allow Him to deal with us as He sees fit, we won't be converted and remade into His image. It takes His presence, His Spirit, inside of us. That's, that's what Jesus died to provide us with. So in a lot of these places, they don't believe in blood sacrifice of a life for a life. There's a lot of ritual, and they've even lost the meaning of it, the real meaning of it. There's a lot of sacrifice in the sense that they sacrifice time and resources, but they're never freed from sin and guilt. Because in order to be victorious over sin, it takes Jesus Christ living in our hearts to change our desires. There's a lot of confederation today between all kinds of enemies of the true people of God. They've got us infiltrated inside. Look at how the devil has, for instance, infiltrated the Western democracies. Some of them um, bear no resemblance at all to their godly inheritance from the time of the Reformation and before. But isn't it interesting to look at the other side of the coin? Let's look at China. There are well over, by many estimates, 100 million, maybe even 200 million Christians in China today. They're being oppressed. But God's got China infiltrated like you wouldn't believe. Guess where the Church is growing at the, at the fastest rate, according to uh, some people that I know that study these things. Guess where the fastest growing Christian church is in the world today? It's in Iran. With Egypt following. Guess where in the world today it's very hard to find a lukewarm Christian? Almost impossible to find a lukewarm Christian. Almost impossible to find a Christian in name only. Guess where that spot is? Syria. If you're going to stand for the Lord in Syria today, you have to be a real Christian. And maybe there aren't very many, but God doesn't care because as long as he's got a remnant, he can multiply it. There isn't a country in the face of the earth today that doesn't have a godly remnant. And that's what God's looking at. God won't multiply things unless he's satisfied with the quality. It has to be up to his standards. It has to be clean. 
God spent a lot of time dealing with the children of Israel to show them the difference between the clean and the unclean. He had a whole tribe of Levites dedicated to that. That was their ministry throughout Israel. And there was no in-between. Something was either clean or was unclean. So now you might want to reflect, as we're all locked down with coronavirus, and ask God to show you, are you clean in His sight or not clean? And if you're not clean and you want to be clean, He'll be happy to help you. He loves cleaning up people. Verse 11 of Isaiah 8, For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a confederacy to all those whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of the hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. I've been hearing all kinds of conspiracy theories. Um got good friends and well-meaning friends, and they think this is all a big conspiracy so that everyone on the face of the earth will have to be vaccinated, and they think that in this vaccination comes this microstrip that's the mark of the beast, and once you've got that, you've had it. You lost your salvation, or you can't be saved. Let me tell you something. Even if this were true, and first of all, it's not that easy to make a vaccine against this virus. There's lots of viruses in the past that they've tried to make vaccines for and failed. So at best, we may have possibly a 50-50 chance of them producing a vaccine. But even if it were true that's a big conspiracy and that they're going to put a chip in us and vaccinate all of us, whether we like it or not, That, doesn't, that would never annul the promises of God. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The scripture says there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So friends, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Isaiah was seeing things very grim, very dark, very evil, and they were. But then all of a sudden, he found himself in the presence of God. And, and here he is, standing before the throne of God, saying, well, who is me? I live in the midst. I'm a man of unclean lips. I've been spreading conspiracy theories. I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And now I've seen the king, and I'm going to die. Because they all knew That unclean, corrupt man can't survive in, in, the, in the direct presence of God. That's, that's why Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden. That's why the veil was between the holy place and the holy of holies. There was a time in Israel when two evil sons of Eli, the high priest, took the ark and weaponized it into a battle against the Philistines, lost their lives, lost the ark, the ark wrecked havoc among the Philistines until they sent it back to Israel. And when it got back to Israel, a whole bunch of curious people went and looked at it, and 50,000 died. And that was the ark that resent, it's the, it was a representation of the presence of God. But Isaiah went up in the actual throne room of God. And that's been the theme of another message. But uh, he had this trouble, and so um, there was a seraphim there that we described in an earlier message and uh, he uh, fixed the problem real quick he took a coal off the altar the golden altar before god representing the the prayers of the clean people of god and uh, touched isaiah's lips with it i bet isaiah never forgot that one i bet i bet every time he op opened his mouth after that um Am I saying the true word of God, or am I back into another conspiracy theory? Okay. Sanctify the Lord of the host himself, and let him be your fear, 
and let him be your dread. Friends, if we belong to God, we depend on him. Even if somebody kills us, we go straight to the presence of God. Let's worry about um, what God thinks of us. Is he trying to show us something? He's brought everything to a halt. Everybody has time now to reflect. Is there something that God wants us to do that we haven't been doing? Is there something that we've been doing that he doesn't like and, and, and we didn't realize it? And I will wait for the Lord who hid his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. That's what the Gospel of Luke says when this time is upon us. It says, look up, for your redemption draws nigh. Isaiah said this in chapter 8, verse 18, Behold, I and the children from whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of the hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Well, he introduced his first son as um, a remnant shall return. God's always going to have a godly remnant, and that's all he needs in order to fulfill his plan and purpose. And his other son, an even stranger name, that's the one that um, he actually conceived and, and was born at the time. And uh, God said that before that child could even say, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. You see, Syria confederated with Israel against Jerusalem. And while they were in the middle of this, an even bigger kingdom, an even worse kingdom, that was actually part of the Babylonian Empire called Assyria, attacked them and totally wiped them out. And then went on eventually to take Israel captive. Yes, there's a lot of bad people out there. And I'm sure the devil's thought up all kinds of wild plans. Uh, he wouldn't mind vaccinating everybody with the microchip, I'm sure. But is it really going to happen? It'll only happen if God allows it. And God has many ways of protecting his people. And one is that those who are evil turn upon themselves. Satan's kingdom doesn't run like God's kingdom. Satan can't just give orders and get everybody to do what he says. He controls the kingdoms of this world by causing division and strife and getting one faction to fight against another faction, and they're all theoretically his kingdoms. Well, another conspiracy story out there is that they're using this crisis. They're going to do away with cash money, and then they're going to control everyone through electronic funds. Well, that sounds kind of interesting. But even in some of the most tightly controlled places in the world today, places like Venezuela, they haven't done away with cash money. Why not? Well, because there's so many corrupt people in positions of power that if you did away with cash money and controlled everyone, they would lose their corruption, and they're not about to do that. So they're going to keep that cash money, even if you have to run around with wheelbarrow loads of it. They haven't done away with cash money in all kinds of oppressive countries, even though theoretically it would probably be to their advantage to control the people that way. But in Satan's kingdom, everybody fights against everybody. They're all against one another. And that's what God says here in the prophecy of Isaiah. They're going to turn on one another. It's going to be like the battle with Midian. All Gideon and his 300 men had to do was get into the middle of the enemy camp at the middle, had, in the middle of the night when God told them to go and reveal the light and blow the trumpet. And the enemy all basically did themselves in and Gideon and his men just had to finish off whoever was left. Evil is going to turn on itself. If we keep our eyes on the Lord, we're going to come into something very, very tremendous. So Isaiah's second son, 
that's mentioned here. He may have had other children. We don't know. Uh, they're supposed to name him Mahershala Haz Hazbash. And that means hurry to the spoil, make haste to the prey. So Isaiah's got the son, and that's his name. And he's and this all happens before the son can even say mommy or daddy. Well, King Hezekiah believed when Isaiah the prophet came, and God smote, I believe it was 185,000, and they took a tremendous spoil. But in the living parables leading up to the day of the Lord, there's one about King David. You remember, he was exiled, and he finally had to take refuge in the land of the Philistines. He was there for almost five months, about five months. And he got called to duty in the Philistine army with his men. They were marching to attack Israel and to attack King Saul. And the king of the Philistines actually wanted David to be his bodyguard. He trusted David more than he did his own princess. But the princes of the Philistines said, no, David might turn on us in the middle of his battle, send him home. So they made him go home back to this little city of Ziklag that they'd given him to live in that was out on the border of the desert. And wouldn't you know the Amalekites, means strangers, had come in and sacked the town, taken all the women and children, taken all David's things, everything, his sons and daughters, everybody lost their families, and they left with it. I mean, what worse could it be? It says David wept until he didn't have any more strength to, wept, to weep, and his men were talking about stoning him. And he decided to consult the Lord. And he had the priest bring the ephod. The ephod was supposed to be used by the high priest. It was uh, all kinds of conditions. But the ephod had the urim and the thummim, and you could get, the priest could get at least a yes or no answer from God. And so David asked. He took the ephod and asked and said, shall I pursue them? And the Lord said, yes. Will I recover everything? Yes. And David took off. And not only did he get everything back, but he got a tremendous spoil called the spoil of David. And he came back with all this and sent gifts to the elders of Judah who were decimated after 40 years of Saul. And then plus they just got creamed by the Philistines. And David went over there and they made him king of Judah. And he delivered Judah and later Israel. And he came in solving everyone's need and everyone's problem. Not, not like when people win an election today and then they take power and decide how they're going to divvy everything up among their friends and their supporters. No. He went in the exact opposite. And that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. There is going to be a tremendous spoil. And God's people are going to have the resources to help everyone else. There's another run through of this in Ezekiel chapters 36 and into 40. And the head of the opposing army is Gog. That's another name for the devil. Magog is the devil's people. And the devil is going to make a last try. He is going to rally his people. He's going to get kicked out of the heavenly realm with his principalities and powers. They're going to get caught down here on the earth. And God's going to lower the heavens and come down. The devil is going to walk into a tremendous trap and be put out of commission for a thousand years and lose all of his key principalities and powers. That's what's about to happen. It's not the other way around, like so many would tell us. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel, from the Lord of the hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And friends, if we're clean before the Lord, we'll be for signs and for wonders too. When, when God brings together this final army, the devil's army is described as having breastplates of iron. They protect themselves by the law. They make everybody obey their laws. Look at all the laws they're generating to try and stop this coronavirus.
The other side, the opposite error, is licentiousness, no law. And people are trying no law and they're trying excessive law. And uh, the only way to get through this is God has to order our steps. And there's things that are good to do right now, and there's things that are counterproductive to do, and only God knows the difference. And the scientists are trying to get a handle on this, and they're trying to get enough information, and they're behind the curve. The, the situation is moving faster than they can do their research. In Joel, God says several times, you know something? If God's people would repent, I might just call this all off and let's just have a big time of blessing. And, and I would just love to bless everybody. In Ezekiel, it says God's going to do this for his people, even though his people look like a valley of dry bones. All these heroes of the faith that gone before, where are they in the eyes of the world? Bones, sometimes relics in some cathedral someplace. What about God's people now? What can we do about this? It's beyond our power to do anything. And if this is the one of the first woes of Revelation, what happens when the other ones hit? For, for those that aren't in fellowship or communion with God, this is going to get worse, not better. But God tells us, look up, because your redemption is very near. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto spiritists and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, shall the people not seek unto their God? Shall we appeal for the living unto the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Then they shall pass through this land fatigued and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God, and raising their face high, they shall look upon the earth and behold tribulation and gross darkness, darkness and anguish, and they shall be submerged in gross darkness. Friends, this is not the time to look at the waves and sink. This is the time to keep our eyes on the Lord. This is not the time to be listening to people who may have a gift of prophecy, but they don't have a word of wisdom. And they're not joined to the Lord. And they're telling God's people a bunch of stuff that may have some elements of truth. But don't you wonder why none of them ever predicted this? Hmm? And that there's few of them that are actually calling God's people to repentance at this time because the judgment starts from the house of God. And if God's people repent, that's what makes it so God can heal our land. And God said he'd do it even if there was pestilence, even if there was locusts, no matter what. And the ones that are looking and they only see tribulation, they only see darkness, they see closing things closing in from all sides. They're making some very unwise decisions, and the people that listen to them are making unwise decisions. Because if you think that the money is going to disappear... If you think everyone's going to get vaccinated with a microchip, well, what would you do? You would start hoarding and storing up and trying to put as much under the mattress as you can and head for the hills and see if you can weather the storm. And God wants his people to stand and be ready to fight when he gives the order. The only way that any of us can convert Earthly treasure, like money or gold or silver or precious stones or annuities or stocks or bonds or, or even our time. A lot of people have time on their hands now. The only way that any of this can be turned into anything of eternal value is if we seek the Lord and ask him what to do with it. And unless we're generous and invest in the kingdom of God, the scripture even says that the one who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. 
I mean, certainly can find someone to help now in this time of need. Surely there's something that you can do that would be of eternal value if you seek the Lord. If you listen to the ones that are talking about the doom and gloom and darkness, you're in danger of making a horrible and possibly irreversible mistake, even with your earthly resources. Isaiah chapter 9, and now here we actually start the message here. Nevertheless, this darkness shall not be the same as the affliction that came upon her when they lightly touched the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, nor afterwards when they more grievously afflicted her by way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles. There's only two verses in Scripture that mention Galilee of the Gentiles, and I will read you the other one here in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verse 15. No, I got it wrong. Galilee of the Gentiles. What did I do with that? It must be here. Anyway, Galilee of the Gentiles is when Jesus left and went up to the land of Naphtali and went up to the land of Zebulun and went to Capernaum. And that's where he began to preach because they were trying to kill him back in Jerusalem. And that has to do with the people of Judah, the Jews, the high priests, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, rejecting Jesus. And what this is saying here in Isaiah is, this darkness that's come upon us now is not going to be as bad as the dark, gross darkness that came over the Jews when they rejected the Lord Jesus. That darkness was worse than the darkness now. Oh, God. I'm slightly dyslexic, and that uh, keeps um, cropping up from time to time. In all my books, my editors keep finding these places where I messed up the reference. Here it is, 415. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness saw great light, and to those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. When they rejected that message and rejected the kingdom of God, and when Jesus died, there was black darkness, even at noon. And the darkness was so bad that God took his remnant and, and eventually spread them all over the world where they turned the Roman Empire upside down. But what happened to what was supposed to be God's people? The Roman armies came in there and totally wiped them out. The ones that took refuge in Jerusalem and didn't get out of there and didn't follow instructions that the Lord gave them for when Jerusalem would be surrounded by armies to flee immediately. There was only a few hours in which you could flee. But the ones that were led by the Holy Spirit got out ahead of time. And the Romans totally destroyed Jerusalem, totally destroyed the temple. They didn't leave anyone alive. No one survived. That was really bad, gross darkness. This time it's not going to be that bad. This time God's got a remnant. The age of the law ended that way, but the age of grace, we're not expecting it to end that way. We're expecting the age of grace to end in hope. Okay. 
There's only three things that will endure, and one's hope, faith, hope, and charity, the love of God. But it's all based on hope, because if we don't hope, that will damage our faith. And if we don't have faith, we won't be able to flow in the love of God. So the devil has gone to great extremes to plant lies into Christian theology. Sometimes a lot of truth and a little bit of a lie, just enough so that God's people waver and lose hope like King Ahaz. Well, this time, what's coming now, it's going to look bad. There's a lot of darkness. Anyone that's not at peace with God is in darkness. But Jesus said prior to this day, the morning star is going to arise in our hearts until the sun of the new day comes up, the sun of righteousness. Isaiah 9, 2, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. This term shadow of death is in 20 scriptures. And 20 is either receiving grace and gifts from God or rejecting them. Ahaz rejected the word that God sent him. Now is the time, if we're going to survive this, to be in God's rest. To know what the realm of the Holy of Holies is. That's where there is protection and covering under his wings. The holy place in the outer court of the temple don't have any wings. The wings of protection are in the realm of the Holy of Holies. Verse 3. As thou hast multiplied the nation, thou hast not increased the joy. They shall rejoice before thee as they rejoice in the harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. We're getting this mention of spoil. That means taking what the enemy has. See, in order for us to come into our inheritance in Christ, a lot of what's described as our inheritance in Christ is held right now by the devil. So the day of the Lord is about reclaiming all this. But in order to reclaim it, God's people have to be clean so that they don't get back into trouble according to wrong desires. God has greatly multiplied the nation. If you study the statistics, there's there's been more people coming to the Lord in the last few decades than ever before. Even large numbers of Muslims coming to the Lord. There have tremendous revivals lit off in unlikely places like Venezuela, all over the world. But the nations that have been going backwards and losing their faith are the nations that should have been the strongest, should have been the backbone of Christendom, Western Europe and the United States, and Canada too. Well, friends, where is this coronavirus hitting the hardest? Have you looked at the maps? There are countries that almost don't have any coronavirus cases, and even those countries are locked down. But the brunt of this is hitting Southern Europe and the coast of the United States. Well, that could change, but that's what it looks like now. God has multiplied his people over the face of the earth, but the fullness of joy isn't there yet. Because you don't have the fullness of our inheritance in Christ yet. And we're still in the midst of a world that doesn't like us. And that's trying everything it can to do away with us and what we represent, which is the Lord. I've said this several times, but China is in a lot of trouble right now. But the worst thing that they've done is to oppress the true people of God. And if they would quit doing that, that would be the fastest way for them to get back into God's good grace and blessing. The same with places like Iran. 
And there's a number of other places like this. Those who belong to the Lord under oppressive places. Well, they have peace inside if they truly belong to the Lord, if they're clean. But the fullness of our joy isn't there yet because we haven't come into the total victory. But just like David going from his very worst time to being made king with all of this abundance of resources that used to belong to the enemy to help the people of God, it all happened in about a week. Don't listen to people that tell you that we're in for who knows how long. Some of them are saying, oh, we must be getting about to the first horseman. That white horse with the crown, that must be the coronavirus. No, folks, that's not the coronavirus. That horse, that white horse, and that rider, that's Jesus. In holiness, the white horse is always holiness. Jesus leads the armies of heaven. And after his resurrection, he started forming his army, going around, shooting the arrows of his truth, conquering and to conquer. And now he's got a, not just one host, he's the Lord of the hosts. He even knows how to use the enemy to turn the enemy against the enemy. He even knows how to use the enemy to clean up his own church. Wait till his army gets assembled here. He says there's been nothing like it before, and there will never be anything like it afterwards. Read Revelation chapter 9 and compare the two armies. Compare the first army with the second army. The first army with its shields of and its armor of iron. And the second army, its shield is fire, God's fire. And brimstone, that's God's judgment against his enemies. Mythology and paganism and the Middle Ages and all of this apostasy has identified brimstone with the devil. No, in the scripture, brimstone is mentioned 20 times, and it's always the righteous judgments of God, starting with Sodom and Gomorrah. That's on the shield of God's army. And jacinth, which is the 11th foundation stone representing Christ. God's got an army that anyone that touches him, all they have to do is touch him, and that's the end of him. And everywhere they pass, anything that isn't of God gets burned up. Wood, hay, and stubble, all gone. It gets described here by the prophet Malachi. A, a real, I mean, this is something you ought to meditate, chew on. For behold, the day comes. What day? The day of the Lord. That shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And that day that comes shall burn them up, said the Lord of the hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor a branch. They're not going to be able to come back. They won't grow back. Be gone all the way to the roots. All of this pride and arrogance in private kingdoms. All under the devil. All fighting with one another. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness be born. He's going to come forth in fullness, and we're actually going to see him, but he's also going to give the fullness of the inheritance, which is the life of Christ, to his people. And we're going to take back everything the enemy has stolen. He's going to replace double for all that's been lost and wasted for 6,000 years. And in his wings he shall bring saving health, and ye shall go forth and jump like calves of the herd, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I make, said the Lord of the hosts. That's what's about to happen, friends. Not this other baloney that's been peddled in the church for the last at least 100 years. 
Isaiah 9, 4. For thou hast broken his heavy yoke and the staff off his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. Midian was the battle, you remember, with Gideon and his 300. Friends, we've been under a heavy yoke. They've put a terrible burden on our shoulders. A burden to be politically correct in a religious sense. A burden of appearances. A burden of man deciding what we're going to believe about God instead of God revealing himself to us and reigning from each and every one of our hearts. For every battle of him who fights is with shaking of the earth and the rolling of garments in blood, but this shall be with burning and consuming of fire. This time, if we're not in a drill, if this is the real thing, everything that's not of God is going to get burned up, starting with the house of the Lord. And we're the house of the Lord. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government is placed upon his shoulder. Right now, all the governments of this world aren't on his shoulder. Daniel saw it like this when he interpreted the dream that Nebuchadnezzar forgot and couldn't remember. Daniel interpreted the dream and saved the lives of all the so-called wise men that had been trying to do in Daniel and his friends. When the government is on God's shoulder, when he has his people that represent him the way he is, he's all about saving people. Those wise men in Babylon, well, many of them might have got destroyed later on. They just didn't learn. They just kept it up. And, and when they got Daniel in trouble for praying three times a day, they finally got thrown in the lion's den. after Daniel spent the night before down there sleeping with the lions. Jesus went down to the lions then for us and broke the power of death. And death is our last enemy. We can't get out of this alive. But there's two ways to die. One is the death of the wicked, and the other is the death of the righteous. We can die obeying God, and we won't see death. It'll be a victory. Because the only thing that death can do to us now is finish off the last traces of the corrupt inheritance we received from Adam. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government is placed upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called the Wonderful One, the Counselor, the God, the Mighty One, the Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. The multitude of his dominion and the peace shall have no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, ordering it and confirming it in judgment and in righteousness. From now on, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of the hosts will perform this. And you see, just like Jesus was born, and Je like Jesus is the Son now he's got a whole body of Christ. Isaiah later on says, a nation shall be born in a day. What's he talking about? He's talking about the dry bones of Ezekiel coming back to life. Talking about those that have gone on before. Many of them were literal martyrs, but many of them probably are going to be like the Apostle John, living martyrs. That simply demonstrated that they preferred Jesus' life over their own life. And they got picked for the first resurrection. And these dry bones, literal and figurative, it's all going to come alive. The people that don't want to be cremated because they think then they won't be among the bones, you know, because they have to have their bones. But uh, how many of God's people got burnt at the stake? You know, God doesn't care. He'll, he'll bring it all back. 
And Joel says to this army, even if they fall on the sword, it won't hurt them. They can't be touched. They can't be hurt. They can't be overcome. They've already put their lives on the line. Gets summed up in Revelation like this, head of the wind. By the blood of the Lamb, because Jesus gave his life for us and covered us with, now with his life. By the word of their testimony. Their testimony is their witness of actually their own experience with God. And they love not their lives unto death. That's what it takes to be in this army. It's going to be an amazing army. Daniel saw that dream of Nebuchadnezzar. A huge statue, a huge image representing all of the empires of this world. Everything from the Babylonians to the Persians to the Medes to the, Ro to the Greeks to the Romans to the present-day democracies. And this stone cut without hands came and smashed it in the feet. Right where we are now. And it all turned into dust and the wind blew it away. And the stone grew and became a mountain that filled the whole earth. Mountains in biblical prophecy represent strongholds. They re represent um, kingdoms. And Revelation says the mountains that we got now, they're all going to come down. And God's kingdom is going to come up over the top. And the mountains of God are going to be reestablished. And Gog is going to meet his end where? On the mountains of Israel. On the truth that God is putting back into place. When he has clean people. Not only, not only to preach the truth, but to be the truth like Isaiah and his sons. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it has lighted upon Israel. How did Jacob get his name? Well, he was born with his hand clutching the heel of his brother. So he got this name Jacob, which means heel catcher, or the tripping up his brother. And he spent his first quite a few years tripping up his brother. And he tripped him up a number of different ways. Got his brother to sell his birthright, and then... Um, as an imposter, got his blind father to give him the blessing. And Esau got so mad, he chased Jacob out of there. And as Jacob was running for his life, he had a dream that heaven was open. But heaven was up there, and he was down here. And the angels of God were going up and down this ladder. So in the morning, he said, he named it Bethel, the house of God. And he said, this must be the house of God. And then he said to God, They'd like to make a covenant with God. If God took him where he was going, blessed him and prospered him, and brought him back to where he started out from, back to his home, then he was willing to give God 10% of everything God gave him. Well, you see how Jacob was trying to get everything to his advantage, but, but God took him up on it. Okay. But then God started testing Jacob. And he went over there and worked 20 years for a father-in-law that was even craftier than Jacob. He just barely got out of there but with a whole bunch of stuff, only to find here comes his brother Esau with 400 men, and now Jacob thinks it's curtains. He's going to slaughter me and my whole family and take everything. And so he wrestled with God. Naphtali means my wrestler. Zebulun means to dwell in intimacy. And Jacob had this wrestling match with God and ended up received of God. He wouldn't take no for an answer. He knew there had to be more. He knew he didn't have the fullness of the blessing of God. He missed something, even with his covenant of a tithe with God. And the only way God could overcome Jacob, he touched his thigh and he crippled his walk in the natural. So 
Jacob, the conniver, got crippled in his natural walk, and he left limping, and he limped for the rest of his life. But he had a new name. He had a new nature. He had a change from the inside out. And now his name was Israel. One of God's names. And God took his name. And that's clear in one of David's Psalms. Why, why would, well, Jesus took our sin upon himself, and, and he didn't sin. God took Jacob's name because God is the perfect heel crutcher, catcher. He, he, he's all about trying to trip up the old man and the old nature and, and get the best of him. So it was a good trade. The Lord sent a word into, into Jacob, and it has lighted upon Israel. God's people, the natural Israel and in the church today, there's lots of Jacobs in there that are trying to figure out how to get God to do what they want. And they're focused on the things here below. And God wants to flip this. He wants to turn it around so that we're willing to sacrifice, even if he has to cripple us, no matter what he has to do to us, so that we start thinking about pleasing him and doing what he wants. Well, Jacob went out there after that encounter and was reconciled to his brother. He started sending his brother gifts. He started paying back and, and at least showing that he was making amends for having gypped his brother. And they embraced and were reconciled. And then Esau takes off and Jacob goes home and there's no more animosity between the two. Well, fast forward several hundred years. The children of Israel are coming out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They're about to enter the promised land and they want to go through the land of Edom, the land of the descendants of Esau. And the Edomites were being nasty because Edom stands for making your own kingdom instead of God's kingdom. We'll see that later on in the book of Isaiah. But... God stopped Moses and said, nope, don't even take so much as a drink of water from their land. I gave that land to Esau. I made a covenant with him. That's his land. He can do what he wants with it. His people can do what they want with it. I don't want you fighting with him. Go around him. Very similar to David not wanting to take the law into his own hands and do anything to Saul. God anointed him, let God take care of him. How in the world did Esau get into a covenant with God and get given a piece of land and have his descendants there even before the children of Israel received the promised land? Do you think it might have had something to do with Jacob and Esau being reconciled? You see, when God sends us forth as his messengers, Jesus said that if someone even receives a little child in his name, they receive him. And if they receive him, they receive the Father who sent him. It isn't necessary to put people through a bunch of religious hoops if that isn't what God is asking for at this time. If we're representatives of God and they can see the difference, like was demonstrated in Isaiah and his sons. If they receive us, they receive him. If they reject us, they reject him. And Ahaz rejected Isaiah. And look what happened. If God's word would have been received and God's people would have been received, Jerusalem would have had no fear whatsoever. And those are just examples for us. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The wild fig trees are cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. We've got these people prophesying now, oh, well, that's coronavirus came, but um, God's going to restore our prosperity even better than it was before. 
There's a lot of that out there on the internet now. These prosperity gospel people don't give up easily. Well, God's in the business of bringing down the kingdoms of this world. And even the kingdoms of this world that get through the coronavirus, that's just the beginning. But God's people are going to get the spoil in the end. See? So beware of people telling you about an easy return to prosperity if they're not talking about repentance and faith. If they're not calling God's people to repentance and faith. At the end of the time of captivity in Babylon, when Daniel had figured it out, God said 70 years to the prophet Jeremiah. The 70 years are past. Okay, let's go rebuild Jerusalem. No, that's not what he said. He got down on his knees and he said, God, we've sinned. We haven't done right as your people. Please, is it possible for you to fulfill this prophecy? And Daniel was probably, well, he's one of the only ones in Scripture where there isn't anything negative written about him. You see, in order to get through this, it isn't just individual repentance. It's corporate repentance. Whole congregations, whole denominations, whole villages, cities, towns, countries have things that it would be wise to corporately repent of. So these people that are saying, oh, the bricks fell down, but we're going to make it back better. you know. They, they cut down our wild fig trees, but we're going to plant cedars instead. We're going to make these Western economies run like they've never done before. We're going to make it even better. Well, look at the stock markets. Look at the zigzags, wild swings up and down. First, they get overcome with fear, and they sell off, and then they see a good deal, and then they all jump in with a bunch of greed to buy a bunch of stuff back up. And it just goes in a whiplash, up and down. Where is this all going to end? And then pour huge amounts of money into their economies, which is probably the only thing they can do right now to keep everything from totally collapsing. And I'm sure many of the government leaders have good intentions and try and do the best for the people. But when you try and make that much money out of nothing, that's how you end up with a million percent inflation like Venezuela or like post-war Germany. It's debatable whether they're going to do away with cash, but the cash that you do have might not be worth much in the future. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against them and join his enemies together, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. Israel wouldn't listen to the prophets, wouldn't repent individually or corporately, wouldn't show a difference between them as God's people and those that weren't God's people, and they totally lost their identity. We've got a lot of God's people now in licentiousness, similar to that. But we've got a lot of other God's people into excessive legalism. The southern kingdom that went legalistic retained their identity, but went into captivity in Babylon. First they fought against Egypt, then they fought against Babylon. Here it says the Philistines on one side, the Syrians on the other side. In other words, you're going to get caught in a pincer between the two extremes. Because when God's people try and do what they think is best and don't have their steps ordered by the Lord, they go in a zigzag from one extreme to the other. And the zigzag gets more and more pronounced. Even then, God says, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. 
In other words, he's going to keep pressing the judgment until he gets a clean people. But his hand is still outstretched in mercy if they'll respond to him. So this is going to intensify as we come to the end of the age and as we come into the kingdom and to the return of the Lord. It's going to intensify until the first thing that gets eliminated is the lukewarm. If you look at the end of Revelation chapter 9, there's the army of God that's on fire, and there's those that are totally in rebellion against God, and that's it. There isn't any other option. But the people did not turn unto him that smote them, neither did they seek the Lord of the hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. It happened suddenly when the ten tribes got lost. But this day of the Lord is going to happen suddenly too. This day of the Lord is going to be a sudden thing. Don't think that you're going to be able to map out three and a half years of this or three and a half years of the other, or so many days of this, so many months of that. Forget it. In your natural mind, you will never, ever figure it out. When the flood took the ungodly away and left righteous Noah and his family. They got into the ark, and guess how long it lasted? 150 days. From when the rain started to when the ark came to rest. Five months. Pretty interesting, isn't it? That's what happened to me when the gorillas kidnapped me. I was out there for five months. And it was a real sting. But God... Totally changed everything. And when I got out of that kidnapping, everything was different. When Noah and his family got out of the ark, they'd lost everything they had before, but everything was different. They had the upper hand. They had the victory over all those people that were out there breaking the heart of God and causing them so much grief. You need to think, we might not be at the first horse. We might be at the fifth trumpet. The fifth trumpet is when an angel comes and unlocks the bottomless pit of the insatiable appetites of all these demons that come out as locusts, and they're allowed to sting those who don't have the seal of God for five months. What's that sting? It's losing your worldly possessions. Losing your job, losing your money, losing your house, losing your investments. What's happening? Are the people of the world getting stung or not? They're getting stung even in the countries where there isn't very many cases of coronavirus because the economy got shut down. And that's the army that's running around with these breastplates of iron and making all this uproar. But guess what? If that's exactly where we are. There's a voice from the golden altar in the presence of God. The prayer to God's people have been asking him to intervene for so long. And he's about ready to send his army. That's the next woe for those that are caught up in the things of this world. And at the end of that one, there isn't going to be any more lukewarm. And if you go past that one, at the beginning of the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God is revealed. And Jesus comes back, and all the kingdoms of this world go down, and his kingdom comes up over the top of everything. So don't let anyone fool you. It doesn't have to be according to the timeline that somebody taught you in some seminar. Revelation isn't a a straight line in time. There's overlaps. Even though we're not to the sixth seal, even though the souls of those who have lost their head for the cause of the gospel and for the Lord are still under the altar asking the Lord, how long until you intervene? And it's clear he hasn't come and began to intervene, although this may begin no signs of his intervention. When the next seal gets opened, the heavens get opened. 
and all those that are causing all this trouble down on the earth start trying to hide. Isaiah prophesied it. Ezekiel prophesied it. Joel prophesied it. But that same scene coincides with the end of Revelation chapter 11 at the seventh trumpet. So all these trumpets looks like they happen in between the fifth and the sixth seal. Isn't that interesting? And by the time the seventh seal is open, there's silence in heaven. What does that mean? It means the accuser of our brethren have been cast down and he's trapped here on earth. And what's Jesus going to do? Lower the heavens and come down. It's going to get real interesting. Look, the experts missed it on the first coming. Totally missed it. The only ones were some humble disciples who had been figuring, according to the book of Daniel, they thought, you know something? These days of Daniel, you know, this, this, this should be the end of the 69th week of Daniel. The Messiah's got to be here. Well, what's going on? John the Baptist out in the wilderness. So they showed up out there. And John told them who it was. And then, isn't it interesting that they're the ones that God picked to be apostles? A bunch of nobodies? Therefore, the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. The ancient and venerable to look upon is the head. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. Do we have all kinds of elders and venerable people that profess and that give great discourses that pass as sermons? But there's a problem if they're going by their human gifting instead of being connected to the Lord. And the prophet that teaches lies, there's prophets out there they can have a prophetic gift that they can know certain things about the future. But if they're devoid of wisdom, if they don't have a word of wisdom from God, it all plays into lies. For the governors of this people are deceivers, and those who are governed by them are lost. Are you part of a religious movement or group Led by a deceiver? If you follow them instead of the Lord, you will be lost. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall he have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He'll still receive anybody that wants to come and follow him. Why doesn't he have any joy in their young man? Because under these type of deals, it's like the house of Eli. God told the house of Eli, he was raising sons of the devil instead of sons of God. Sons of Belial. And God said, this will not stand. This line is going to be cut off. There are going to be no more old men. All of your descendants are going to die as young men. What does that tell us? If you're in an Eli religious system, there is absolutely no way that that can bring you to maturity in Christ. You are always going to remain immature. And now is the time. It doesn't matter your physical age. You can be a little child, and it's easier to come in the kingdom of God and trust the Lord, and he is mature. And he covers us with his maturity. Neither shall they have mercy on their fatherless, because if people are claiming the church is their mother, and if God isn't their father, they're fatherless. And widows, if the church thinks they're married to gifted leaders instead of to the Lord, they're widows. And as long as they persist in this, 
God's mercy and his truth go hand in hand. He loves to have mercy, but he will never back off on the truth. And so if we want to have mercy, if we want him to have mercy on us, we have to let him tell us the truth, show us the truth. Starting with what he thinks about us. Because if he shows us the truth and reveals it to us, starting with us, that will bring us under conviction so that we surrender to him and let him change us. Instead of being in these places where everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer and every mouth speaks folly, for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. I can remember a number of times, you know, from time to time, different scenarios, preaching in a church full of people, only to have the pastor afterwards take me aside and say, how many of these people do you think are really saved? So I turned it back on the pastor and I said, what do you think? He said, very few. But even in the worst places, God still has a remnant that's his. And we can be thankful today that there are places on fire for God. There are places where the real gospel of Jesus Christ is more contagious than the coronavirus. And tremendous things are happening. Isaiah 9.18 For wickedness burns as the fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest and they shall mount up like the lifting of smoke. If you look at that army of locusts, there's fire and there's smoke. And the, the devil's army is chewing on itself. The politicians can't get their act together. Some of them think they ought to do one thing, some of them think the other thing. They're chewing on each other like you wouldn't believe. And that's just part of the scene. Churches that depend on having the physical presence of the congregation so that some person that's got a soul tie to the people can twist their arms and get money out of them. Like the guy I knew about that in an oil town took out a $13.5 million loan to build a big sanctuary because some prophet came by and prophesied that the Lord told him that Go ahead and get in debt and build however big a building you can and God was going to fill it. What's going to happen to that place now and to that debt when oil prices a few days ago went below zero? Where's those $13.5 million going to come from now? At the time, I said, you know something? That doesn't sound to me like a true word from the Lord. I think that's a false prophet. And my friend who was with me said the same thing. But they didn't want to listen. Verse 19. Though the wrath of the Lord of the hosts, through the wrath of the Lord of the hosts, the land is darkened. And the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. And he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat each man the flesh of his own arm. These places are going to devour themselves. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh. They're going to devour each other and their, and their brothers. And they together shall be against Judah. And even though they're devouring one another, they're still going to go together and attack Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And friends, God's hand is still stretched out. At the end of the war to end all wars, described by Ezekiel, and the enemy army is totally demolished, God says, now, I'm going to set up my people and they're going to know I did this because of my people. And my clean people are going to dwell with me here on Mount Zion. And I want all the Gentiles to know 
Because if they want to come up here to Mount Zion, they can have blessing. And if they won't come, they won't have blessing. See? So when Jesus comes back, he's not going to slaughter off everybody on the planet. He's not going to run around looking for who didn't pray the sinner's prayer and let them have it. When Jesus comes back, he's going to clean his people up, destroy Satan and his army, and put a clean example up for anybody that wants to come. Joel put it like this. The sun shall be darkened. The attraction and lure of this world and its prosperity and commerce, that's all going to go out. The moon has blood. All these people that have been manipulating and everything, and they're going to tear into one another, and they've been misrepresenting God. The stars shall fall from the sky. Anybody that's trying to gifted person that's been trying to join people to themselves instead of to God, that's all going to go down. And he says, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Which hand is still outstretched. Even in the midst of the day of judgment. That is very close at hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing the truth to your people. And we pray that your people who are clean, or even those who know that they're not clean but want to be clean, would put their eyes on you and not look at the wind or the waves. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.